Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you all for attending. It's uh, nice to be able to get together with so many different people uh, from around the world. Um, so today, um, it's a short talk, so I'll, I'll basically be giving like an advertisement for um, a method uh, to apply to probabilistic combinatorics. And I'll talk about something called the random cluster model on random graphs. And this is uh, joint work with Tyler Helmuth and Matthew Jensen, uh, both in the UK. Um, oops. So, um, okay, so uh, let's, let me just give you a little motivation for studying spin models on random graphs. Uh, and so this is a statistical physics model. Uh, one reason to study them is uh, for combinatorics. They're a great source of examples and counterexamples. And so for example, uh, uh, independent sets on, on random graphs, these are often uh, near extremal or have some very interesting properties. So uh, that's one reason. For probabilists or statistical physicists, random graphs are interesting because they have some non-trivial geometry. Um, but uh, sometimes analyzing these models is tractable because of a nice connection with infinite trees and recursions. And they, they would call the random deregular graph the beta lattice. Um, and then finally, uh, another reason, and maybe the reason I got interested in these things, is that uh, spin models on random graphs uh, can be a source of hard computational problems or gadgets and hardness reduction. So there's a very nice connection between combinatorics, probability, and uh, computer science here in these models. Uh, so let me, let me be precise and tell you what uh, kind of spin model I'm talking about. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the POTS model. It's an assignment of, uh, it's a probability distribution on colorings, assignments of Q colors to vertices of a graph. And how, what weight do you give to a particular assignment? Well, the, the Gibbs measure assigns probability proportional to e to the beta times the number of monochromatic edges in the graph under this coloring. Uh, and then, um, of course, you need a normalizing constant, and this is the partition function. Uh, and this plays a key role in statistical physics. It also plays a key role in combinatorics. So you can think of the partition function as some sort of weighted counting object. Uh, and so if you think that you want to apply some statistical physics techniques or ideas to combinatorics, it's really the, the partition function that will play the role of counting. Uh, this parameter beta, this is the inverse temperature. Uh, and uh, if beta is positive, then you prefer uh, monochromatic edges. It's called the ferromagnetic case. That's mostly what I'll be talking about today. If uh, beta is negative, then it's anti-ferromagnetic. Okay, and so here's a, like a simulation if you have a 2D grid. If uh, beta is small, so the interaction strength uh, is, uh, is low, high temperature, you see something uh, disordered. So here on the left, it looks relatively, relatively random. Of course, neighboring vertices might uh, more often have the same color, but if you, if you increase beta and decrease temperature, then the interaction strength is quite strong. And what you end up seeing is uh, typically you'll see one of uh, the Q colors dominate. So here, I guess this is four colors and uh, pink is dominating. And so that, that's what the statistical physicist would study, a phase transition between disorder and order here. Um, okay, so I, you know, just to give a very high level overview of how do we study spin models on random graphs. Uh, and I guess the history is sort of that there's some, you know, all the classic probabilistic methods that we know and love, uh, the first and second moment methods, concentration inequalities, uh, maybe a little more recent Friedgut's theorem, uh, these techniques are used in combinatorics to study these things and often give pretty good answers. Uh, but they, they do fall short in, in general of pinning down it precise thresholds. And so for instance, the, the question of what's the Q coloring threshold of GNP, this was posed in the first erdos rainey paper, but still is unsolved. And there's some, some pretty good reason uh, uh, that these are still unsolved. Uh, and that is because uh, the answers, or at least our conjectures, come from a completely different field. And this is this cavity method from statistical physics, uh, a non-rigorous method that predicts very precise thresholds and structural changes. So perhaps you've seen this picture of like the solution space shattering and then condensing, and maybe a talk by Amin Koja Oglin uh, or someone like that. Uh, and then and the main, main objects here are belief propagation, something called the beta formula, 
and replica symmetry and replica symmetry breaking. Um, I, I do want to emphasize, though, that in uh, maybe in the last five years, uh, many aspects of the cavity method have, have been made rigorous. And so we, we are coming closer to understanding uh, on a rigorous level this uh, physics, these physics predictions. You know, maybe you've heard of the Ding Sly Sun paper on the random KSAT threshold or results on the stochastic block model. Uh, many, many papers by Amin Koja uh, So we really have progressed uh, a lot in this direction. Okay, uh, the technique I'll talk about today, though, is uh, something uh, quite different, and it, it goes back to more classical statistical physics, uh, analyzing lattice models uh, and sort of old-fashioned statistical physics. And those, the two tools are the abstract polymer models and the cluster expansion. Um, and this is yeah, classic technique from statistical physics. In particular, it was the method used to really uh, first gain a good understanding of the POTS model on the integer lattice, at least for large Q. Uh, and then recently, I, I've been uh, with some co-authors been using the cluster expansion to design algorithms. So uh, a paper with Tyler Helmuth and Chris Rex, a uh, paper with Matthew Jensen and Peter Kibosh, um, and some others. Uh, we can use this old technique, but now now turn it into alg uh, an algorithm. And probably more interesting for this audience is that you can use uh, these tools in combinatorics. Uh, so Matthew and I have a paper on independent sets in the hypercube. Uh, Bala, Garcia, and Lee have a nice paper on independent sets in the middle two layers. Uh, Matthew and Peter Kivash just posted a paper. Um, so this, this technique, I think, is very versatile um, and has lots of applications in combinatorics. In particular, I think two of our talks, my talk and Yoshi Balag's talk, uh, was on the big seminar uh, uh, for this uh, combinatorial and geometric uh, lab. Oh, great question. Is abstract polymer model related to hardcore model? That's an excellent question. I, I sort of refer you to the talk I gave in, in this big seminar or the paper I have with Matthew, but the answer is yes, uh, very much related. An abstract polymer model is basically, uh, I'll, I'll describe it a little bit later, but it's, you can relate it very closely to a non-uniform hardcore model. Uh, but great question. Uh, so that's just an advertisement for this technique. Uh, and today I want to say that you can actually use this technique in probabilistic combinatorics, analyzing stuff on random graphs. Um, and the basic idea of this is that you want to write a partition function, like the POTS model partition function, in terms of defects or deviations from some ground state, and then express the log partition function, the logarithm of this thing you're trying to count, uh, as an infinite series, a sum over clusters. And this is the cluster expansion. Okay, so today I'll, I'll talk about the ferromagnetic POTS model on random graphs. And I'll emphasize, I wanna emphasize this is the easy case. Okay, the, this is always replica symmetric in the, in the language of statistical physics. Uh, there's a, we know the ground states, there's Q maximum weight configurations, uh, as opposed to anti-ferromagnetic POTS model, which is much, much, much harder. And if you understand that, you understand, for example, the Q coloring threshold of PNP. So I'm, I'm focusing on the easy case today, but that means maybe we can prove some very detailed results. Okay, so what's known? Uh, and this is uh, mainly from a paper of Galanis, Stefankovic, Vigoda, and Yang, and also a paper of Dembo, Montanari, Sly, and Sun. Um, so for the POTS model on ran random deregular graphs, uh, there's a critical uh, temperature, a critical inverse temperature of this form. Uh, and what happens? So if beta is below the critical temperature, there's a disordered phase. So it looks like, I mean, it's, it's on a random graph, but it looks like what we saw on the left before. Uh, the colors appear roughly equally in a, in a typical configuration. Um, Will, we'll, so, sorry, uh, sorry yeah. well, I think your slides uh, haven't moved since the slide hour technique. I don't know if it's- Oh, okay, let, let me see. Uh, some, sometimes this uh, airplay Ah, that's better, right? Yeah, that's better. Uh, okay. Maybe maybe you, you need to go in one slide before. Yeah, okay. that's uh, luckily I didn't say, I, I didn't say too much interesting um, before. So this we have seen, this slide we have seen. Okay, great. The whole slide? The whole slide, yes. Okay, great. The next slide I was just saying, uh, ferromagnetic is the easy case, um, but yeah. uh, thank you. Okay, so great. So, um, right, so what is known? Uh, we have this critical, uh, beta, 
Um, and below, below critical, so when the interaction is, uh, strength is weaker than the critical interaction strength, there's a disordered phase. And what, what they know about the disordered phase is that the marginals are close to uniform. So you see roughly equally uh, pink, brown, green, white. Uh, for beta above the critical uh, beta, then we have Q-ordered phases, meaning that a typical configuration from the POTS model has one dominant color. Either pink is dominant or blue is dominant and so on. Uh, and then at, at the critical beta, uh, the, the Galana, Stefankovic, Vergota, Yang, they were able to pr prove some form of weak phase coexistence. They, so they showed that each of the Q plus one phases, disordered plus the Q order phases, each have some like, at least some inverse polynomial probability. Um, and, and basically behind these results, these, these techniques are second moment method and some variants of the cavity method. They gain a good understanding of the free energy. And so what is that? That's you take the logarithm of the partition function for the graph on n vertices. Uh, you take an expectation over the randomness in the graph, divide by n and take a limit. Uh, and so this is the free energy. And basically you can, if you have a good understanding of the free energy, you can derive uh, results on the phase transition like this. Okay, so, but what questions might you wanna ask if you wanna know more detail? So what precisely happens at critical? Exactly how is, does phase coexistence manifest itself? Um, what is not just the distribution of one over N expectation log Z, but uh, what is actually the distribution of log Z? And so this is what I would call finite size scaling. So what, on what order are the fluctuations? What's the distribution? Uh, how do correlations be behave? Do you have exponential decay of correlations? Do you have long range correlations? Uh, what is the local spin distribution? So Mihun mentioned local weak convergence. We can also talk about local weak convergence here where you look at the local weak convergence of the graph, but also the random spins on top of it. So if you pick a random vertex, pick a random configuration, what does it look like in the depth T neighborhood? Uh, and, and so the, the punchline is that uh, we can answer all of these questions uh, in great detail um, with a caveat that we can only do it when Q is large. So Q here should be greater than something like D to the D. Uh, so pretty large, uh, but, it, but uh, under that restriction, we can answer all of these questions. And more generally, we do so for something called the random cluster model. And it's not, not just that we want to be more general, but we actually really need to work in the random cluster model as opposed to the POTS model. So let me tell you the random cluster model. Uh, it's a probability distribution on edge sets of a graph. Okay, um, and so there, So what's the probability you pick a particular edge set? Well, it's e to the beta minus one to the number of edges times q to the number of connected components of the graph that's the vertex set with this edge set. Okay, so it's, some, it, it's actually some uh, tilted bond percolation. So you do like edge percolation, but you tilt the measure by this q to the number of connected components. If Q is one, then this would just be edge percolation. Uh, and of course you have a partition function again. Um, and now there's no colors, right? The, you have two possible ground states, the disordered state where you, you take no edges and the ordered state where you take all of the edges. Uh, and, uh, and to emphasize Q can now be real. It doesn't have to be an integer, uh, but there's a nice uh, coupling with the POTS model when Q is an integer. So in particular, the partition functions are the same. So understanding one, you understand the other. And basically if you pick uh, a set of random edges according to the random cluster measure, and then look at their connected components formed by them, and then randomly flip like a coin for each connected component and assign a color to each of the Q colors, then you get a, 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 a distribution of colorings uh, according to the POTS model. Uh, so basically, if you, can, if you can answer questions about random cluster model, you can get results for POTS model. Uh, there's a nice coupling between the two. Okay, so uh, here are our results and it doesn't, I, I don't need to like be so precise here. I just wanna give you a flavor of what type of results these techniques can give you. Um, and so our results are for D at least five and Q large enough. Uh, so there exists some critical beta of course, when Q is an integer, it has to agree with the previous formula. Uh, and so we can say that the free energy is analytic except at the critical uh, and the, the Gibbs measure ex exhibits exponential decay of correlations. So the correlation between two vertices decays exponentially in their distance. 
Um, moreover, we can say what the measure converges to locally. There's some uh, two particular measures on the tree, the free and wired uh, measures on the infinite tree. Uh, and you, we, locally, you converge to the free measure if beta is below critical and the wired measure above. And then we can say exactly what happens at critical. So at critical, uh, we, we can actually determine uh, precisely the distribution of the weights of the ordered and disordered states. Uh, so this is some random variable. Its mean is like one over Q plus one for the disordered. Uh, and maybe not surprisingly, it's some sum over independent Poissons with weights. And so of course it has to do with the small cycle counts uh, in the random graph. Um, but that, those are the results. Um, so actually our motivation was uh, algorithmic. And so we wanted to we wanted to actually find an algorithm to sample from the POTS model at all temperatures. And so in, in fact, the, the method automatically gives this. So uh, we can approximate the partition function and sample efficiently from the random cluster and POTS model at all temperatures on the random regular graph uh, when Q is large enough. Uh, okay, so um, I'll just give uh, three or four minutes of uh, what's the idea. So the, the first step in the, the, the proof is something fairly easy, which is to say, if Q is large and you're on an expander graph, then a tip with very high probability, a typical configuration will have uh, from the random cluster model, will have at least 90% of the edges or at most 10% of the edges. Okay, so the, the middle ground, this error part uh, is exponentially small. And so what that means is you can really focus on understanding the disordered and ordered partition functions or the disordered and ordered Gibbs measures, meaning restricted conditioned on having at least 90% or at most 10% of edges. Okay, and so uh, the one slide on polymer models and cluster expansion, the idea again is to rewrite a partition function as a sum over a collection of disjoint geometric objects of the product of some polymer weights. And so uh, uh, Rupe asked, is this related to hardcore model? This is exactly a hardcore model on these geometric objects with uh, incompatibility being some sort of disjointness condition. And then if the weights decay fast enough as a function of their size, uh, the cluster expansion, this power series converges and you can obtain lots of detailed information. The important point is the weights must factorize over disjoint objects and decay. So that's, those are the two things you need to check. Uh, so, okay, so we need to do this for the disordered and the ordered. And so now, now you imagine you're looking at deviations from the empty configuration. And so the edges you imagine are fairly sparse. And we're just gonna say that the, the polymers are connected components of occupied edges. So, so our, these are our polymers. And then it's pretty easy to say what the weight should be. Well, we lose, we lose a count in the connected components. We had N connected components, but now if you have an edge, for example, you lose one connected component but you gain this e to the beta minus one factor for each edge. Okay, and then, it, then it's not hard to show that if you have expansion uh, and uh, you're in some range of beta that the cluster expansion converges. Uh, the more interesting one is the ordered phase. Uh, and so uh, here we think of defects from the all occupied configuration. Now the red edges uh, represent missing edges and your first, your first guess would be to say, well, let's look at uh, polymers being connected components of uh, unoccupied edges. The problem here is that the weights don't factorize. So each of these connected components of missing edges doesn't disconnect the graph by itself. But when they are all together, then all of a sudden you've disconnected this vertex. And so this is the, this is the really tricky uh, point here is that uh, if, if you if you tried to have uh, polymers be connected components of missing edges, the weight function wouldn't factorize because we have this non-local random cluster interaction. And so the idea is the following. We, we start off with that as our definition, connected components of unoccupied edges. But then we say, if you look at a vertex, let's say here, and uh, at least, okay, five ninths fraction of the edges are missing, then you add this dotted, this dotted edge to the, the set of bad edges. And you do that inductively. So if we started with the red edges unoccupied, then we would have added all the dotted edges. And in fact, now this whole object here becomes one polymer. 
Okay, and and the, the point is that with expansion, this process doesn't go on forever, uh, and in fact, it doesn't it doesn't add too many edges uh, to your polymer. The weight function then is uh, it, it uh, counts the number of connected components you've added and uh, penalizes you for the missing weights. Um, but this works, and so that that was really the the tricky part of this. How do you deal with the non-local random cluster weight, and and we do it with this inductive definition. Okay, and so the consequence is that we have convergent cluster expansions in some non in some overlapping region of uh, betas, and and this gives us uh, algorithms. This gives us all the probabilistic properties you ever could imagine: exponential decay, large deviation bounds, central limit theorems, uh, formulas for expectations, anything like that. Okay, so uh, to conclude, just a few open questions. Um, one is to just prove that the beta critical matches the integer case. For some reason, uh, we really have no idea how to do that. Um, there's some technical reason we needed to look at d greater than five, but there should be a way to extend that. Um, I think for, for this audience, maybe the best open question is the last one, which is, uh, I would love to hear of more applications of polymer models and cluster expansions in combinatorics or probabilistic combinatorics. I think, I, I think it's, a, it's a tool that everyone should try to learn. It, it seems to be quite useful. Uh, but that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have uh, some time for questions. So. Um, I, I will. Yeah. Uh, so, um, does this technique also applies for for negative beta? Uh, no. Uh, so there, there's no there's no connection with the um, to the, for the POTS model to the random cluster model when beta is negative. Uh, so that that so we're really using this random cluster um, representation. I mean, you can so you can get some results like you could if. If you want to look at anti-ferromagnetic pots on a random bipartite graph, we could certainly get algorithms when the, the temperature is low enough. Um, so that's a fairly general technique. But if like this question of trying to get algorithms and understanding at the critical point and for all temperatures, uh, this, this really relies on this random cluster representation. So, so what is really Maybe I, I never really get the the concept of how how this um, clustering uh, expansion or or this polymer model works. Um, like for the example that you mentioned, the the um, the, the uh, in the bipartite graph, if you want to study the independence that problem, yep. and I think before your work, it was considered that low temperature was was the hard regime, right? No matter for algorithm or or for just, uh, yeah, I, I think it was considered to be the hard, but somehow your results says that with really low temperature, you can sample efficiently, but not uh, the, the high one, but uh, already past the Gibbs um, uniqueness point. Yeah, so it's, it's, I think it's very subtle. So, uh, and these problems are captured in this complexity class, sharp BIS. And these are problems that are uh, as hard as approximating the number of independent sets in a general bipartite graph. And that's completely open. We don't know whether that class is uh, MP hard to uh, sample from or approximate. We don't know if it's in polynomial time. Um, I, I think the, the takeaway from the work I've been doing is that if you can understand it probabilistically, then you can actually sample. And so hardcore on random bipartite graph, we actually had a pretty good understanding of probabilistically. Um, and this, you know, th this is how Sly proved his hardness. He, un he used random bipartite graphs as a gadget to prove hardness for non-bipartite graphs. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's an interesting interplay, um, but it, it's, it, I think it's pretty wide open. But the, the, certainly the hard instances uh, for POTS or hardcore on bipartite should not be random graphs. Okay, so your result applies for random bipartite graph, but not- I mean, for expanders, random. it does. Not for general graphs, but for expanders, it certainly does. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions?
Okay, if no, then let us thank Will again. Thank you, Will. We hope to see you in Moscow more often. Yes, thank you. I, I would be happy to come once we are allowed. Yeah.